All right, welcome everybody back to another Commander's Film Room. George Carmi, Mark Bullock, Nick Ackridge, welcome fellas. It's, uh, this week we will be checking out new Commander's Offensive Coordinator Cliff Kingsbury. This is an interesting one, fellas. The air raid offense goes back to high school football in Texas and then to into college, some of the big programs like Oklahoma. And uh, it's a it's a system, Mark, as I think we'll see, that is that is built in its foundation on simplicity. Uh, but yet, and I, I read somewhere today, they, they only wanted to run plays that they ran in practice. They only they wanted to make it as simple as possible. And people from all over the place used to go down and, and with Leach, and he was always had the door open, and they would ask him about the air raid. And they would talk about the simplicity. And the coaches would leave and were always feeling like they had not given them all the information because it couldn't be that simple. Uh, so I'm curious to get into the tape, Mark, and, and see kind of what it looks like. Yeah, the uh, the air raid system is an interesting one. Uh, that you're, you're right, it is based on simplicity. It's based on going as fast as possible and obviously a lot of passing um, and a lot of trying to attack down the field. Uh the, the one thing I would say is, you know, the, the big thing out of Cliff Kingsbury's press conference, his introductory press conference last week, was he was kind of distancing himself from that air raid system a little bit. Um, and you're right, like everyone has gone down to to try to figure out what's going on with the air raid system and then see what they can apply to it. And you see quite a few of the concepts uh, that are in that system commonly um, have found their way into the NFL. Um, but it's the NFL is far more complex and then there's a lot more um, layers to an NFL offense than what's in the typical air raid system. So um, you have to kind of adjust and adapt and, and then hopefully we'll, we'll show that today that, that Cliff Kingsbury at least started to adjust and adapt his offense to what a kind of standard NFL offense is um, with obviously some core principles um, involved in it. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has anything else to add to that or we want to just dive into the film. Let's get into it. All right, cool. Uh, so the first thing I thought we'd look at is, as we talked about, the air raid is known as this high passing, always in the shotgun uh, offense and then hardly ever running the ball. And certainly in college, K Cliff Kingsbury did that. Um, and, you know, as, as his first year in the NFL, he, he did lean more on the passing than the run game but the longer he was in the NFL with the Cardinals the more his offense kind of fell more towards the neutral NFL offense where they incorporated a lot more of the run game um I don't know Nick if you have the run pass splits at all but they they definitely ran the ball a lot more frequently than uh you would probably expect them to given the the nature of the air raid system um and they were they were quite uh diverse in the type of runs they they did they, they used a lot of gap scheme runs so um not quite as much zone as you might expect but it's a lot of gap scheme and they did a lot of different types of gap scheme stuff so um i thought i'd start us off here with this is a basically a power run but rather than having the the guard pull and wrap around to pick up the linebacker they're they're making a little twist by having the tackle pull um and obviously it's out of the gun and you're having the running back go to the same side as, as the as the puller rather than going across um so ev everyone talks about when you run from the gun typically the running back will always run away from the side that they're aligned to but to break that tendency they've got this going to the same side so um as i run this through you'll see you get a couple of little down blocks you get the tackle pulling around here he's going to pick up that linebacker and your running back's almost got a two-way go here you can go kind of either side um the, the linebacker kind of gets shoved into the outside gap, so he cuts it back inside, and then he springs it for a nice long run. Okay. Um, and that, that's kind of your your typical gap scheme stuff where you're moving guys around um, and, and pulling guys and, and kicking defenders out to open up lanes. And um, you got another one here where um, this time you're in the pistol formation with Kyler Murray. Um, you got, uh, I think it's James Conner at running back, and, and you've got a little bit of a read option element where this edge defender is going to be read by by Murray, but he's going to hold his position, so it's going to be held, uh, handed off. Um, and again, is the tackle pulling rather than the guard? Um, might just be because they had more athletic tackles in Arizona. It might be 
you know that they they felt that this was a nice uh, way to um, if you're really optioning this guy um, then you can have your guard block this guy easier and, and pull the tackle easier so um, but again it's another gap scheme run tackles gonna pull Kyler Murray's gonna read this end and, and you're gonna have him held by by Murray um, and what that's gonna give you is a favorable look to the to the play side of the run and Connor's gonna run up in the in the middle of that run for a, a little game um, and then he builds out off of those kind of uh, counter run gap scheme runs you, you've got um, uh, one of their favorites is a kind of guard tackle pull scheme um, where or a guard tackle counter scheme um, normally you would have just one guy pulling and you might have a tight end or a fullback off here following him this time they're going to have it's kind of a risky system because you're leaving essentially two gaps completely uncovered here by pulling both of these linemen uh, but it, what it does mean is that you get two extra gaps on this side of the line uh, that the defense has to try to flow over and and, and uh, account for. Um, so again, they're going to pull these guys across and one of them's going to kick out, one of them's going to wrap around. And what that ends up leaving is a huge lane right in the middle of the defense. And they're going to pick up a nice solid game. And then it gets more and more diverse as as you got more into Kingsbury's offense in, in this is all 2022, so this is the latest version of his NFL offense. And here you see an unbalanced line. So you've got the tight end playing left tackle. You've got the left tackle on the right side of the line as a tight end. Um, and then you're going to have a load of different pulling bodies here. There's a lot of lines drawn in here. Uh, but you've got a load of different options moving all about the place. Um, and again, it's the kind of gap scheme stuff where everyone's moving all over the place. You've got two guys pulling to this side. You've got a tight end pulling this way with... Kyler Murray is the read option threat. Um, and again, it's going to end up with this nice big lane for the running back to run into. Um, yeah, and then if you can if you go back real quick, like this sort of stuff, the misdirection and the, the unbalanced stuff like that, you can just kind of watch. I think that's 57 there. The linebacker just watching pause and he's just, he's clearly lost because again, you're kind of reading your keys and you see the guard pulling. So he wants to get over, but then he sees Ertz, the fullback pulling the other way and it just kind of freezes him just for a second and gets you that like, extra two to three yards that you're kind of looking for like right yeah here, he's just kind of frozen right, a little yeah, bit and he still freezes he's frozen. Mm. yeah still kind of frozen after the handoff. yep actually i see still a question frozen. for you mark whenever you get a chance yep. so for, for one my immediate takeaway is it seems like this type of offense is dependent on a pretty athletic tackle right like i feel like we need to improve in regard to charles leno and andrew wiley i can't necessarily see them doing these big <laughs> polls i don't know if you agree to that or not and then uh, two uh, Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I, the question too is how reluctant are, or sorry, how dependent is this offense on a mobile quarterback? It seems like a lot of RPOs, a lot of like moving with Kyle, Kyler Murray as well. <clears throat> yeah. So um, in terms of the tackles, um, it, it depends on, in, in Arizona, it might just been a case of they really liked how athletic their, their tackles were and those tackles gotcha. could pull. Um, Andrew Wiley is certainly very capable of pulling. He's more athletic than, and people give him credit for Charles Leno probably isn't that kind of guy anymore. But um, again, you don't have to necessarily pull the tackle. You can pull the guard, um, mm -hmm. especially if you've got a, a more athletic guard. And, and maybe if Andrew Wiley ends up kicking inside to left guard instead of right tackle, he'd be a really nice option to, to be a guy that can pull. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, in terms of the quarterback run scheme, um, certainly this system in Arizona, uh, used it plenty, but when you have a guy like Kyler Murray, you're going to use it. Um, if, if you're not, if you're not using it, then you're not using the ability of Kyler Murray to to the fullest extent. Um, so, I, I am hesitant to say it's reliant on a on a quarterback being mobile, um, because, like, again, if you're not using Kyler Murray in the run game, then you're not making use of of all your best yeah. possible talent so um yeah but th th certainly they did use it um, yeah, he's and, just and more so kind of just taking advantage of the fact that you have someone as athletic as kyler murray and mm -hmm. i mean exactly. with the number two pick if they go quarterback all three of those guys that they could pick can very much handle this sort of stuff and they're um freak athletes in their own right so yeah I'll it, take it's, that too. it's a <clears throat> huge part of anytime you can get a quarterback to run like just from the base you know Part of it, just adding a number in the run game, just makes everything ten times easier. Yeah, yep. it's 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 simple math, really. Um, you know, normally the the defense only has to account for ten 
offensive players with the quarterback not being a part of it. And if the quarterback is suddenly a part of it, they've got an extra body they have to account for. Um, and that makes things so much harder to, yeah. to do we, defensively. We saw it break defenses with in 2012 with RG3 and Morris and made Alfred Morris Absolutely. look like, the, like an mm-hmm. all-pro. It's just, <laughs> yep. it literally broke the NFL. I mean, obviously they've they've picked up on it since then, but um, it just makes things easier just having that element. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're about to see again that element here. Like um, when when you have a quarterback like Carla Murray or as Nick said, any of these guys in the draft could potentially do this kind of scheme, you can be real creative with your run game. So here they're going to have a receiver um, come across on a jet sweep and you're going to have the running back and the tight end both arc out and and this is a read for Kyler Murray. So he can either dump it off to this receiver and run this out to the edge, or you're gonna have, again, these two, the tackle guard pulling to the other side and, and Kyler Murray then turns into the running back and can run off that side. Um, and so what we see here is uh, when you get that motion across, Murray ends up deciding, oh, do I hand this off, do I keep it? And you've got a lot of guys, you've got one, two, three, four here, all kind of flowing this way um, and that leaves basically three defensive linemen to try to block the five offensive linemen plus Kyler Murray. So Murray decides to pull this ball and you can see already like you've got this kick out here, you've got a wall here and there's going to be a big lane for mm. Murray to follow behind his, his pulling tackle. Um, and he's going to ju- do just that and, he, and he's off to the races. Um, so that, and we'll see, see the end zone angle of it here again. Um, you get, this nice wall off inside you get the kick out here you get a lead blocker and and, and murray's just going to follow in behind it and, yeah. and go off to the races so um, yeah i mean as, yeah, as, you- like as mark mentioned like you think of kingsbury and you think of just an air raid attack of five wide receivers which they they did a lot um but their run game was really effective i mean just looking at from 2019 to 2022 like yards before contact is kind of a big thing that you can look at to see how well you're sort of blocking how well you're, you're scheming things up. They were they were second behind only Baltimore and right mm. tied with Philly. Um, explosive run percentage, again, top 10. Um, rushing yards per attempt, top 10. All of that was top of the NFL, and it wasn't because they were doing it in you know a small amount. They were still kind of league average with, with their run rate. So, um, yeah, he knew what he was doing with the run game. Yeah, for know. sure. Um, and the, the encouraging thing for me is that he showed elements of building off of that run game. It wasn't just, we've seen in Washington, like with Scott Turner, it was, he ran the ball because Ron Rivera was directing him to run the ball. And there was no real (laughs) involvement of the running game and the passing game. It was just, it was almost two separate offenses being run at the same time. Whereas Kingsbury in Arizona showed uh, uh, an understanding of, okay, we have this really effective rushing attack. How can we build off of that into a passing game? Um, and so one of those ways is is what we'll see here with a, a little RPO thing here where you've got, a, I think this is DeAndre Hopkins in the in the slot here and he's just going to run a little RPO slant. Um, you're going to have, again, this guard tackle pull combination to the right side um, and the back can take it inside where, where Murray can pull it and, and throw that slant. Um, and you'll see here all these linebackers because they've seen the, both these guards, uh, the guard and the tackle pulling to that side you're getting a lot of flow to that side, which is opening up a big gap in the middle of the field. And Murray's just going to quickly pull that ball and throw that slant over the middle to Hopkins for a nice, easy five or six yard gain. Um, and again, you build out of that into other types of RPOs where um, you've got an RPO here that is um, more of a pre-snap RPO based on um, the numbers count. So you can see we've got a DB here and a DB here. Uh, so you've got two on two. Um, and then you've got six guys in the box, and then you're basically playing a numbers game. So if this safety rotates down the box, you've got seven in the box. That's more than what you're probably looking to block. So you're gonna pull that ball and throw that that um, screen out here. Um, and what you see here is that that safety does come down in the box. So that gives you seven in the box, and you've got um, your five offensive linemen plus a t- uh, tight end. So that's six blockers against seven. That's obviously a bad count to run into. Uh, so instead, they're going to take the two on two out here and throw this bubble screen. Um, but again, it, it's building in uh, a little bit of passing elements to the run game. Um, and this is another little RPO here where you have a little swing screen um, to to the flat. And this time you get 
all these defenders all flowing outside to the to the RPO to the to the passing option. So Kyler Murray's just gonna have an easy give read. He's gonna give this to the running back, and, and you can already see at this point they've got this sealed off inside. You've got this uh, tackle pulling. Actually, this is a guard pulling around, and he's only got this poor little defensive back in the, in the open field <laughs> here to block. Yeah, and you're gonna have a very very nice easy run right out the middle uh, for a touchdown. So they they build in these RPO elements to it, um, which helps them get from their run game to their passing game and, and blends things into it. Um, hey, Mark, a real quick question from the, from the chat. Um, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, or maybe Nick can pull it up. Do you guys know what personnel do they run the most in this whole air raid Kingsbury offense or any tendencies? Yeah, they um, – um, yeah, yeah, well, most teams are most teams are 11 personnel. That's what they usually just run the most, you know, one, one running back, one tight end. But – um, the thing that was unique about Kingsbury was he ran by far the most 10 personnel, which is just one running back, zero tight yeah, ends. Yeah, I heard that. Mm -hmm. um, he ran at 17% while he was there. The next highest was 6.5. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it was definitely more wide receivers on the field than, than anything else you, you'll definitely see. And again, we don't know 100% what he's going to do here in Washington, but um, just looking back what he did, you're going to see a lot of wide receivers on the field. Gotcha. And was it, what is it, a fast offense at Arizona? I know that's one of the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah. They definitely. They definitely incorporated tempo, and we'll we'll get into some of that as well. But um, yeah, in terms with with the personnel, um, it definitely started off very very wide receiver heavy. Um, I would say as he evolved in the NFL, he started to involve more of the tight ends um, and and get into different personnel groups with some two tight end sets and stuff um, later on. But they definitely always had those um, four three and four wide receiver sets fairly consistently um so yeah they definitely involved those the kind of traditional air raid uh, stuff but um he, he was trending more towards a more traditional nfl style offense um the more he was in the nfl um so this is another this is the this is the other element you can have when you have a mobile quarterback like kyler murray and maybe if you get someone like a Jaden daniels uh, i mean you could do it with drake may or kayla williams as we said but it's more probably suited to a, a Jaden daniels type where um, Why'd you say Jane Daniels first? <laughs> he's the better runner. Um, so Touché. you got you got the, um, the the kind of swing screen RPO over here, um, and you can see you've got four defenders going out there, and you've only got three guys blocking it. Uh, whereas in the box here, you've got four defensive linemen against the five offensive linemen plus the Mike linebacker. So in theory, you've got four on three over here, which is a bad look, but you've got five on five here, which is a good look. So Kyler Murray can either throw this swing screen or, or keep it himself and, and run up the middle. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to keep it himself and he's going to run. And then you see, again, his his talents as a as a runner. Um, so then we talked about the RPOs and, and you can build into the RPOs. You can also build into the kind of play action stuff as well. Um, and Kingsbury did a, a nice job of kind of combining the two. Um, a typical play action look that you'll see is what what the Shannon system calls a, a kind of a drift route. Um, some people call it a strike route or a glance. Um, basically, you have a receiver that kind of gets to five or six steps in his route, and then he kind of just drifts over the middle and tries to find space over the middle. Um, and this, this to me, I think is an RPO based on how the offensive linemen block this, but it, it could well be just a play action pass. Um, and you'll see um, you get this linebacker actually runs out here, which would suggest you should probably hand this off as it is not if it is an RPO, but he's going to buzz out to the flat so quickly that this receiver is going to bend around him, and Murray's going to see that. Um, so he pulls the ball and throws, and unfortunately, the receiver drops it. But if he catches that, oh. the safety's here, and this yeah, receiver is off to the races. So um, yeah, unfortunately, he drops it. But um, Again, this is the same kind of idea. You've got some misdirection stuff with a fullback or a tight end running out, a swing thing out here. But again, your main focus is you got that kind of drift route um, with a potential RPO or a fake handoff inside. Again, it's building off of the run game that we, we've seen. Um, and you get all this displacement with guys moving all over the field and, and you open up these nice big lanes in the middle. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's real nice play action stuff. Um, so what I would say from watching Kingsbury is I, I like that there are core elements of things that make NFL offenses work. You see there's a, a, a clear gap scheme identity with the run game. 
um, and they build off of that with RPOs and play action. Um, the the things that I I want to talk about is that he doesn't necessarily blend the play action game with the run game particularly well. Um, and I'll show you here kind of an example. It's tough to show because I can't show you the entire game, but basically <laughs> this is a really nice typical play action concept. You'll see this from every pretty much every team in the NFL, but especially all the Shanahan tree guys. You've got a, a deep hook here and you've got a, a kind of deep bench or corner route out here. Um, <clears throat> And basically, you're hoping you get in your play action, you're going to get your linebackers to bite up and you can hit one of these two routes. Um, the issue here for Kingsbury um, in this game, he had never shown this look before in this game. Up until this point, when you when you want to run play action, the best play action fakes are ones where the defense is like, oh, I recognize this look from earlier in the game. It's the outside zone we saw earlier. So we're going to flow to that. And then suddenly they're out of position. Uh, this this was a look that he hadn't shown the entire game and it's frustrating because you got a two tight end set a diamond pistol look it's it's quite a nice look to to be running out of um but he didn't use it um and so you'll see here as we run this on uh you see you get half a step from a linebacker uh and then basically nothing no other movement forward from anyone in this second level and mm. everyone just sinks back into coverage immediately nobody's biting on that fake because they hadn't seen that before um and also you know, with the way the pressure with the way the offensive okay. line is playing it they're just at least the left tackle was just dropping set just straight into a pass set and there was no kind yeah. of there's no believability there hey mark yeah the, the small details do get missed a little bit in this offense sorry go ahead no to that end you, cliff kingsbury seems to be a very smart you know offensive play design creator right how does he in regard to sequencing in regard to like kind of game flow? Have you caught any trends in regard to that? Is he pretty good at kind of building off and kind of building momentum or like, or, or well, are there like also, staggers? Go it'll ahead. also be interesting to see how and why, you know, Anthony Lynn is here to maybe provide some of that. Yeah. Um, so the, the sequencing is, it is an issue and it's not an issue. It, it's one of those, as I say, like, there are core elements of the offense that are really nice and you can see that there is a plan to build and layer off of each other. But as I just kind of showed on that last play, and then this one is another example, you have a really nice play action concept that they want to get to. Uh, and they've set stuff up by running the ball with certain looks, but then they don't run those same looks when they get to the play action stuff. And, and that's the kind of thing that really blends an offense together and really makes it hard for a defense. Um, because this is a play again, another play action concept here where you got this deep over, you got a deep post over the top, you got a backside curl. Um, but this is a look they hadn't shown in the game at all up until this point. And suddenly you see this look, and again, you'll see the linebackers here. They hardly bite up. They take a little step, jump, step forward. And as Nick said, again, you get kind of an obvious tell from the offensive line. Like nobody's really selling a run fake. And like the back is kind of worried about trying to chip on the edge here. So he doesn't even go to the quarterback to fake the handoff. Um, so these linebackers have nothing to really, there's no run keys here for the linebackers to be like, oh yeah, this is the run that we saw earlier. We need to bite up and open up this gap over the middle. So instead they're able to fall back real quickly. And this window for this over route is just not there. Um, now what they do get is, uh, they get lucky that this safety goes, okay, I'm going to go bite on this, even though I've got another safety shallow here. And they, they're going to have this deep post over the top, which which Murray just misses. Um, but that wasn't the main core of the concept. The main core of the concept was that over route, which they didn't get the linebackers out of the way of um, with the play action fix. So, um, and another one here, very similar concept. Um, you got two go routes on the outside. Again, you've got this crosser, this deep over. Um, this is the same look that we just saw in the last game, but again, they didn't run it at all from this look in this game. Um, so they're faking it again, but they they haven't actually run a run the ball out of this look. This time, at least the running back fakes the handoff. Um, but again, they're only getting minimal bite from the linebackers. They're immediately able to drop back under this, and and you can see this guy's taking that first window away, and this linebacker is ready to match this crossing route and take the second window of it away um which then leaves murray either having to check this ball down or, or hope that he has one of the go routes on the outside um and he ends up checking chucking the ball down the field on the go route but they don't make it so um 
So the play action stuff is the core concepts that they use in play action is good, and the core concepts they use in in the run game is good, and you can see the elements of we want to build out of the run game into our play action game to get into our passing game. They just don't marry it up properly. They they don't they don't fake the same runs that they use in the run game to sell the play action fakes as efficiently as they could do, um, and that is something that you know a, a guy like Carl Shanahan is so so good at. Um, mm-hmm. And that's probably why they wanted someone like Anthony Lynn to try to get him in the building to help with that. Um, and then hopefully he will, um, to, to Doug's point, that Anthony Lynn is is, is probably the, the number one hire for that. But also, um, you know, you could possibly lean on Brian Johnson because the Eagles have, have certainly not the past season, but the year before that were very good off of play action. Um, so there's a couple of guys in that building now that hopefully will be able to help Kingsbury um, layer his offense correctly and, and match up the run game with the play action game to to really make the thing work because the elements are there. Um, it just needs to be married up nicely. Yeah, and um, you, you just kind of hope that, you know, he's done some self-scouting of himself and he's... Sure. You know, again, like a lot with a lot of coaches that get a second opportunity, it's like, are you humble enough to... So like this didn't work. I, I got to change it. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the biggest thing I think is, is like Mark said, is can he change that up? Can he adjust to what this kind of new sort of style of NFL is where you see a lot of the best offenses right now are, are heavy play action where the play action looks the exact same as, you know, a normal run play. Um, so that's kind of definitely the big thing. And motion. Um, what, what was this? Do you, do you have that? Were they were they heavy on motion with the no, Carolina they were, offense? No, right? they were they were bottom of the league, um, right. bottom of the league, and you know the amount of shifts and motions that they used, um, which you know is a little worrying. But a lot of these teams kind of use shift and motion just to say, hey, we 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 had a motion. Um, there's not, you know, obviously again we go back to the Shanahan tree. They they do a really good job of using that motion for a purpose. Um, so again, you kind of hope that he self scouts and, and sort of looks at that as something that could help him, but you don't want them just motioning just to, for the sake of motioning. Like there's no, um, there's no reason to motion if, if it doesn't help you essentially. Um, so, but yeah, they were, they were bottom and, of the bottom of the league in it. And, and part of the lack of motion, uh, is the tempo aspect of things. Um, they, to try to line up and go quickly and you know, obviously, if you then if you get lined up and then you have two guys going in motion one after another that suddenly is slowing your tempo down right um so if, if you're wanting to line up and snap the ball quickly and, and catch the defense off guard you're not going to have as much motion and, and that was something they definitely like to do um the types of motion they did like to use uh, is an example here uh is basically moving the running back out wide to go empty formations um and they did that the they did that quite a lot. Obviously, we, we've talked about the air raid being a pass-heavy offense, and, and part of the pass-heavy thing is having a running back that can split outside and, and catch the ball um, and run routes and stuff. Uh, but they didn't just go five wides and, and go completely vertical. Um, they still ran some nice concepts, and, and that's what I wanted to highlight here, was they, they have a, a running back in the backfield that motions outside, uh, but they have a little slot fade concept over here to the to the left um and then you got a nice i know it's a hammer concept but uh, some other people other things you've basically got a receiver uh pivoting underneath here tight end pivoting underneath here and that is to be bait for whoever is an underneath defender to try to get them to bite up and then you have a wide receiver kind of wrapping around on a, on a basic cross behind them and you're you're basically hoping that you have a zone coverage with a defender in the middle here that that sees this receiver and, and jumps up and then you can hit that Thing behind it so um we'll we'll play this out here you get that motion outside um you kind of get a, a somewhat of an indication that it's zoned based on how they kind of moved out with it you didn't get a linebacker running out there you've got a corner out there um and then again you're gonna have um they're gonna look to this slot fade but it's not gonna be there um you're gonna have this linebacker bite up on on this pivot route and you're gonna have uh, the receiver wrap around over the middle um, and you have this nice big window over the middle of the field uh, for that receiver to run into. 
um, for for a nice gain, and and that is a very Shanahan style of of attack is attacking the middle of the field. Um, and you've got another one here. This isn't empty. Um, it, it's a fairly similar formation, but um, this time the back stays in the backfield, and he just runs a little swing route. Um, and again, you've got it's a fairly basic combination. You've got a corner flat combination here. Um, you've got a variation of that concept that we just looked at where you've got the tight end kind of faking outside and, and pivoting back in uh, and then again you've got that receiver kind of wrapping around behind him and the goal is again the same you're hoping to get a linebacker biting up and, and hit that thing over the middle um, and if you get a zone coverage you might be able to work this this combination on this side um, so we'll run this one through and you'll see again you get a man coverage here um, so this is kind of dead Murray comes back over the middle of the field um, he probably could hit this here. Um, he kind of opts against it and waits for this tight end to pivot back inside. But again, the tight end's pivoting away from the coverage um, and he hits him over the middle. But again, it's attacking the middle of the field. Um, hmm. And well, ran that one through a little bit too quickly there. But uh, one more example of them attacking the middle of the field. Um, here we got, this time again, we got an empty formation. We got five wides. Um, we do have that one big vertical down the middle of the field, but you got the two outside routes, two underneath routes um, from the outside. Um, and then you've got a variation of that corner flat that we just looked at before. Uh, you got the corner route from the slot, and then you're you're faking that flat route from this outer receiver, and he's going to pivot back inside to give them basically three options over the middle. Um, and again, the idea is you get um, the defense push back and space and create space in the middle of the field which they have here underneath nice and easy and you got big yards after the catch opportunities and and so there are fundamentally core parts of this offense where you're attacking the middle of the field and Kingsbury does a really nice job of, of calling route combinations to help them do that and and that stuff that the best offenses in the in the league do like Nick said like the Shanahan systems and uh, ben Johnson with the lines and stuff, they, they do it via play action and then Cliff tried to do it via play action but as we talked about the play action didn't quite marry up nicely but when he just called his core passing game um, they managed to attack the middle of the field um, pretty consistently and again you've got another one here where um, you've got all this bait going on out here to get these linebackers to bite up um, and you just get this receiver wrapping around into the middle of the field and it's a strike over the middle and just look at how much space he's got there, There's there's nobody within five yards of him um so you get plenty of yards after the catch opportunities so hey, um sorry mark and nick so in regard to application right obviously we're a commander's podcast do you see a lot of like the commander's talent and roster applying <clears throat> to these concepts or do you think someone will stand out like it seems like it might be needing more wide receivers in this grouping probably and maybe more of a pass catching running back maybe i don't know what are your thoughts on all that you definitely need more depth at a wide receiver yeah, I um, think so, right? For sure. Yeah. Uh, right now, you can kind of really only count on on Terry and, and Jahan. Uh, you yeah. don't know if you're going to bring Curtis Samuel back. But, again, Curtis Samuel is a guy you could use as a pass-catching running back. Like, he's versatile enough to to do that sort of thing. And um, I think he'd be a fun fun little chess piece for them to use. But, um, yeah, definitely need a, a pass-catching running back as well. And you just need more depth. I mean, more solid depth, especially if you're going four wide receivers consistently. And they had smaller receivers in, in for the Cardinals, is that right? Yeah, that was that was, that was a weird kind of thing that they kept kind of hitting on. Um, they they love their small receivers, but they also had you know DeAndre Hopkins and I think that's AJ Green there as well. I can't remember how long. Yeah, they there. have AJ Green yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. So they they definitely had their their big you know um, possession type of receiver um, that you know you could possibly see Terry McLaurin being, but who knows? Yeah, I, I would I would build onto that. Like Terry McLaurin is certainly a guy that you see all these routes where they're running over the middle of the field. That's exactly where you want Terry McLaurin catching mm -hmm. the ball. Um, so 100%, I think he fits this style of offense. I think Jahan Dotson um, can do some of this um, underneath stuff, uh, little pivot routes and choice routes and, and stuff like that underneath to be the kind of bait underneath. But if if the defense sits back, he can catch the ball and, and make plays after the catch. And if you get man coverage instead of zone, he, he's a guy that can separate um, doing that kind of stuff. So I think he fits. Um, I, I think Nick's been reading my articles because earlier in the offseason, I said I suggested Curtis Samuel as a potential um, off the radar 
third down back option. Um, and I really like that idea, um, especially in this offense where they move that running back outside so often. Um, mm. if, you, if you have Curtis Samuel counting <laughs> as your running back, um, and you, it basically gets you an extra receiver on the field. Um, so uh, yeah, that would be I interesting. Didn't, I, didn't remember, I didn't remember you said that. I was trying to think about which article, but yeah. See, when we're, uh, when we're in agreement, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then one other thing I, I'd point out, uh, a guy in the Cardinals offense from 2022 uh, and, and before that, Marquise Brown, or Hollywood yeah. Brown, um, he, they traded him to Arizona and uh, he's kind of on the record publicly saying he really likes Cliff Kingsbury. He's a free agent this offseason. Um, so he's someone that certainly would make a lot of sense for them to bring in. Um, he was a heavy volume and, guy too, right? Even at a small size, I feel like he was like, like what a hundred targets or something. He was, he was he's known for being a heavy volume guy, even though despite his size, he got a lot of targets under Kingsbury. Um, yeah. And when when DeAndre Hopkins was out injured, he got tons of targets. And then when Hopkins came back in, his target share dropped down a little bit. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but he he certainly is someone that would make a lot of sense. Another guy that for me would make sense uh, is Juwan Jennings from the 49ers. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Adam Peters obviously is is the obvious link there, um, but uh, you know he, he's a big physical wide receiver that would give him a, a little bit of extra size. He, if if you want to bring him into the to the run game elements that they like to do with the gap scheme stuff, he he certainly is a very physical blocker that could get involved in that. Um, so he's someone that I think would make a hell of a lot of sense as well. Um, if, and, you, if you're looking at some argue, free receivers, I'd argue Jennings is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. Clearly, wow. Um, no, that was a joke. Was okay, a joke. I'm gonna say like, damn, yeah. like, like what the yeah. next level? That's, my, ten- that's my Tennessee bias showing. And okay, got you. Okay. The one wide receiver draft thing that I've hit on in the past couple of years. So, I'll take <laughs> <you go. laughs> um, so yeah, we go back to the the film I've got here. Um, this was just an example of uh, like uh, everyone talked about. It's all five or five wide receivers and and no tight ends and and that. That was possibly true in his first year in the NFL, but by 2022, it wasn't true. Um, certainly, he, he would make use of all the receivers, but he also, as you can see here, he's got three tight ends on the field here. Then he's got AJ Green, who at this point in his career wasn't really the receiver he once was, but he offered the same kind of size as a tight end. Um, and again, you're, you're running not too dissimilar a concept to what we've already seen a couple times now, uh, where you've got a tight end running a, a kind of a flat route and a corner route so you got this kind of corner flat combination and then you've got this kind of hammer concept on this backside and then you've got a running back running uh, a little texas route um underneath um and the de- play of design is really nice here you, you motion the tight end across um and then you'll see here as we i think i've drawn up on here as we get into it um yeah so you've got uh Guys pivoting, at, if, if you're reading this outside and across, uh, you've got your flat route that's getting covered. You've got your corner route that should be wide open because this this corner is, is biting up to the flat. Uh, so really, this ball should be going right there right now. Um, but even if Kyler Murray for some reason doesn't like that and this safety is coming across, uh, he then has this receiver wrapping around here to replace where this, this safety was. Like so point. really, he should have touchdown one here or touchdown two here um but instead he tries to take this running back underneath um and uh ends up getting the running back a little bit killed uh, with not the best ball um and but uh yeah so this was another one where they've got multiple tight ends um and they're using and, and to uh, back that up with back to that up with numbers to make you guys think that mark's not actually crazy they uh, 12 personnel percentage six highest um in the NFL over that three-year span. So um, he's not lying when they said they definitely started to use more tight ends, which could be something that uh, Washington really needs to look into then. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would definitely agree with that, especially Logan Thomas's contract, I would say. They, Wasn't, they, they, was Logan they, Thomas with Kingsbury? Did they overlap at all? I don't think so. Not as a tight end. Maybe as a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't think so as a tight end. I think he went to. I think he was in Detroit by the yeah, time. Yeah, he was in Detroit at the time. Okay. Also, yeah. By the time, <clears throat> by the time Kings, Kingsbury entered the league. Um, yeah, where were we here? Right. So we got tight end. Um, another thing that he would like to use uh, tight ends for was tight end screens, uh, and and you can see tight end screens are kind of a, a very underused thing. People don't think about the tight end on, on a screen at all. When you think about a, a screen, it's obviously 
a running back leaking out of the backfield or a kind of bubble screen or a tunnel screen to a wide receiver. You never think about the tight end screen. Um, and so here they're going to they're going to bring a receiver in motion and they're going to run what looks like it's going to be three verticals. And, but that's all just to clear out the defense. And then you get this tight end peeling off um, on a little cheeky screen. Um, so you see that bring that running back in motion and uh, you get these verticals and the tight end fakes blocking and peels off and then you get your offensive lineman out in front. Now their offensive line don't do the best job in the world here, but um, they get the block and, and they, they've got set up nicely. Um, they don't have any kind of what they would call a rat kill. Uh, I'd probably prefer this lineman on the backside to be kind of trying to cut off these guys to really clear that lane. Um, but you still you back your tight end to be able to outrun them and, and you get some blockers out in front and yeah, first down, so it's not a bad screen, uh, not a bad screen at all. Um, but like kind of we mentioned earlier, the kind of small details are, are get a little bit missed in this offense, and that's not necessarily 100% down to Kingsbury. We got to remember Kingsbury was the head coach in in Arizona, so he had an offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach, and he was relying on those guys to make sure that they were on top of the the really small details, but. Um, when you look at the best screen teams in the league, they always have what's called this rat killer, where uh, the lineman that comes off back on, on the ed on the back side of it is always, rather than going out and trying to block someone, he, his first look should be back across and trying to cut off these guys. Now, you can't block them in the back, so you have to be really careful, but you just have to kind of get in their way. Um, and if this lineman peels back and just kind of gets in this defensive tackle's way, then suddenly you're going to have a block here, a blocker out in front and you're going to clear out this lane for the tight end to really hit this um but unfortunately these two guys are able to chase him down um on the back side but still 10 yards but it could have been potentially more if they they took care of those smaller details um and then again this is another little tight end screen here and this is one where they do build in a little bit more of that this is a you know we've seen these runs all the time with a guard pulling to the side um we haven't necessarily seen this end around fake but you know it's a nice little misdirection to add into the play um and it's getting out all the defense to go this way to set up this screen on the other side um so again a nice little tight end screen here um just to show that they can make use of the tight ends um again you want a little rat killer here to take care of this back guy uh they don't get it but um they still get out nice in front and the tight end makes a nice play and picks up another first down so um so yeah, they to say it's an offense. Like, I think the 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 point I want to make with with these clips, specifically with tight ends and the screens and stuff, is as we kind of pointed out, that this offense was stereotyped as a very bad tight end offense. You don't want to be a tight end in this system. And when Cliff Kingsbury entered the league, that might have been true um, in his first year, but by the by the end of his spell in Arizona, it certainly wasn't true. They they used tight ends plenty. Um, and they even made the, I think they made the trade for Zach Ertz. I think it's Zach Ertz that's catching this tight end screen. Um, so clearly they, they do value tight ends, um, certainly good ones. Um, so there, there is, there is stuff for tight ends in this offense. If you have good ones, um, I think as Mark, we kind of talked about Mark, with Washington. Is this, a, is this a number system? Do you know if they, uh, you, you mean with play calling? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, as far as I'm aware, no. I, I don't I don't actually know exactly what the, the terminology of the air raid system is and, and their system is going to be different than what a basic air raid system could. My understanding of the air raid system is you literally have like a, a, a list of about 100 plays. And so you just call play 87 or play 62 or whatever. Right. Um, so in that regard, it, it is technically a number system, but it's not the same as Scott Turner's number system where you would call 525 F pivot and the 525 is, is telling receivers their routes. The, the two outside receivers are running five routes, which are comeback routes. The, the slot receiver is running a two route, which is a shallow cross. And then you got your F receiver tagged on the pivot route um, and that kind of thing. So um, that that's not what this offense is. Um, if, if there's numbers in this system, um, it will be purely like the entire play is number 87 on the call sheet. Um, so, but I, I, I imagine this system will have more terminology to it, especially given they've got a lot of West coast guys in that, 
building now. Um, Anthony Lynn's obviously coming from the Shanahan system. Um, Brian Johnson's coming from a kind of variation of the Andy Reid system, which is another West Coast system. Um, so you've got plenty of guys that are in a, a West Coast terminology offense. So I, I don't know what Kingsbury's system is. I haven't seen his playbook, but I'd imagine it will probably be more word-based than, than number-based. Um, so the last little thing I had on the end of this was we talked about kind of the small details. Um, they, they kind of got overlooked in Arizona. And again, Kingsbury was the head coach rather than the offensive coordinator. So um, he had to worry about the defense and you know, like practice schedules and, and talking to the media every day and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's easier for a head coach to overlook those smaller details. But Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay were also head coaches and they don't miss the small details. They are... That what makes them so good is is making those small details um, and this is a little example of that where uh, you've got a little duo run scheme it's a gap scheme you've got two um, combination blocks double teams inside um, and what they do here is they bring this uh, receiver inside and when you bring a receiver inside and duo the idea is you get him to come inside and block the safety that's coming down into the box which then leaves this corner unblocked but it means the corner then has to go and make a tackle on the running back um and all offensive coordinators and coaches will tell you we want to make cornerbacks tackle um because they don't want to be in the box defending the run they don't want to tackle um so when you run this kind of system and you and you this kind of scheme this duo scheme quite often you'll see teams bring that receiver in um with the lions ben johnson did this a ton and and saint brown or josh reynolds lined up here and they would they'd insert into the blocking stream and, and they they'd go and block this safety and you'd see corners really struggle to to make a, a tackle um this receiver gets this small detail wrong instead of going in inserting inside and blocking the safety he just tries to block his corner uh which makes him kind of pointless in, in this system if, if he's going to line up inside all he's doing then is just adding a corner inside and bringing the safety into the box and they don't get any benefit of him blocking the safety because he's blocking his corner. He could just as easily line up all on all the way outside the numbers and take the corner outside the numbers, and he doesn't have to worry about blocking in there. Um, so if you're going to bring this receiver in tight, you want him to block this safety. Uh, but as we run this on here, you'll see he doesn't block the safety. And when you see Connor sort of pulls this run back, that safety is right there in that hole completely unaccounted for. Um, and he's going to make that tackle, and then Connor's not going to get anything on the play. Um, so it's kind of little small details, and this is another one. Um, and again, it's not all necessarily on Kingsbury um, because he's head coach. He was head coach at this point, doing lots of other things. But it's the small details that really make a, a decent offense become a really good offense. Um, and this is one where you've got a corner blitz coming from a mile away. It's a super long blitz coming from out here. Um, and you've got five offensive linemen and you've got uh, the running back and the tight end in the backfield and they're both staying in to protect. So you've got seven blockers here to pick up what's essentially going to be these four down linemen plus this fifth guy over here. So you've got seven on five. You should be able to sort that out. Um, now what ends up happening is nobody looks for this guy at all. And typically that is typically the offensive line are responsible for the, for the five down and one of the linebackers, which means Either the running back or this tight end should be peeking out here and checking for some kind of blitz, either from the slot or from the safety. Um, but as we run this on, again, the small details get missed. And you can see the running back and tight end are both looking this way. I'm not sure why they're looking this way, because there was no slot corner and this corner was a mile off. Uh, so I don't, I'm not sure where they thought a blitz was coming from from this side, but they're looking this way. Uh, and meanwhile, this corner is coming blazing off the edge with nobody accounting for him on the outside. Uh, and he's going to char charge down Kyler Murray. Now, Murray does a nice job of, of scrambling out of there and, and getting rid of the ball. Um, but he shouldn't have had to have done that. They should have had, they had seven guys in there. They should be able to pick that up. And again, that could, that could be partially on Murray. That could be partially on the offensive line. That could be partially on, that could just be down to the tight end of the running back not doing their job properly. But it's the small details of, you have seven guys into block what is essentially a five-man rush and one guy is coming completely free that just cannot happen as an offense um so 
I think I've got the end zone angle to, to wrap this up. Um, again, you see tight end steps up and looks inside. I'm not really sure who he's thinking of blocking. He's probably, I'm guessing he's checking the linebacker, but yeah. they have the running back inside. Again, I don't know who he's looking at. Or I don't know what he's thinking of blocking. <laughs> Maybe he's thinking of chipping this guy, but he, he doesn't chip him. Uh, and, you know, these guys are kind of screwed here. The left tackle has to block his guy. Um, and this is just going to leave the slot corner coming in completely unblocked. But you've got the running back not really blocking anyone, the tight end not blocking anyone, the left guard not blocking anyone. Uh, and Kyler Murray just sitting here going, oh, I've got a free rusher on my blind side. What am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to run away and, and get a throw away. So, um, so yeah, that those are the, the the main two concerns for me. Are there's the little details that uh, need to be picked up on and adjusted and corrected and and hopefully when with Kingsbury is just the offensive coordinator rather than the head coach he can pay a little bit more attention to those and obviously the coaching staff they've assembled um, comes from a bunch of guys that were very detail orientated um, so you'd hope that they would all pick up on those details um, so the the small details are are a big emphasis for me and then finding a way to to marry those run and, and pass game concepts um, with a little bit better play action fakes and, and an understanding, hey, we've run these types of runs all game. Let's fake that run so the defense actually believes we're, we're doing that. Um, and, and that should open up the middle of the field a little bit more and, and make those those play action passes a little bit more effective. It's interesting. A lot of guys on this coaching staff that don't have a lot of experience together or necessarily even in the same systems, it'll be interesting to see how those philosophies mush together and how and how quickly right because again this notion that you've got a ton of time to put all this stuff together just isn't how it tends to work out in the league yeah it's um that that would be my main concern with this coaching staff is it's great to have a bunch of different minds that have come from all different systems it, it means that you should be able to generate a lot of different answers and, and do a lot of problem solving and that's fantastic uh, the issue is getting everyone on the same page and then getting everyone to buy into this is the way we're going to do things because the way they're going to do things here isn't going to be the same as how Anthony Lynn did it in San Francisco. It's not going to be the same Brian Johnson did it in Philadelphia. It's not going to be the same that any of these staff did it elsewhere. It's going to be this way they're doing it here. And they're all going to have, hopefully, it's going to be a collaborative effort and they're all going to have a say in how it's done. But it's all going to be a little bit different and, and they're all going to have to be able to collaborate and, and and not have any kind of egos get in the way of being like, this is the way we did it and, and we went to the Super Bowl doing it this way. Why are we not doing it this way? Um, so, um, and, and hopefully that's that's where, you know, you've valued leadership so heavily in, in a guy like Dan Quinn as your head coach. Um, you would hope that that's where he's able to come in and keep everyone on the same page and be like, hey, this, this is how we're doing it and I appreciate this is how you did it elsewhere and then we're going to take bits of that but we're also going to take bits of what other people are saying and and hopefully it can all come together nicely into a into a um, cohesive system rather than a, a bits and pieces system from that doesn't really work well together well mark you, you mentioned a couple of times during this episode about you know kingsbury and being the head coach and their little minutia and and hopefully to your point like just being able to do this will 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 help him in a way that he wasn't able to do when he had everything uh, under his purview. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're fine. Go ahead. Yeah, you're just building on that point. I, you, you hope that um, with he's with he's able to just focus on offense. Like I, I think people underestimate just how much a head coach has to do. Um, like, and some of what a head coach has to do can be um kind of given to other members of staff but um they, they have to do obviously they have to set up the practice schedules they have set up meeting schedules they have to set up um the they have to do deal with the media every single day um they have to deal with any kind of story that you're not necessarily expecting if, if one of your players was called out smoking somewhere or whatever you have to answer questions about that you have to it, whatever random bullshit comes up you have to deal with that um, off the field issues never happen here in washington yeah, exactly. <laughs> never happen here in washington it's all, strictly, it's all strictly on the field stuff exactly um so when you're when you're the offensive coordinator you're you're shielded from that a little bit you, yeah. you don't have to deal with all that 
nonsense and you can just kind of coach the offense and, and spend all your time focusing on um, how's what's our offense going to look like, uh, what's our game plan going to be and, and what, what are we going to do when this defense is, is showing us this look on, on third and nine, what are we going to do? Um, so, uh, yeah, hopefully that can kind of narrow his focus into just being a good offensive coordinator rather than all the other nonsense that, be, that comes with being a head coach. But uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. Okay, I think uh, that wraps it up for this episode. Next week, fellas, I think we're talking about Jaden Daniels. Uh, so that ought to be uh, a good one. I'm excited to see that one. We've already done Drake May, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this time um, I can actually bring something to the plate. So they're just gonna. Yeah. I'm just gonna let it all to you next week. Okay, I don't know about That's that. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it be a fun night. Night, pal. See you Tuesday. All right, bye. Uh, see you.